So recently, friend of me of the show, Ruben Strayer, as well as Andrew Merriman and Michael Permuter, put out a excellent article in the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine on uh, airway management with ketamine. And one of the primary features of that article was what Ruben and his group is calling ketamine-only breathing intubation. Um, they're describing a technique I call dissociated awake intubation. And uh, accompanying the article was a blog post. And inside that blog post was a video of one ketamine-only breathing intubation or dissociated awake that Ruben did. And this led uh, to some conversation between Ruben and George Kovach, Canadian airway guru, and then George and myself, and a two-hour discussion and numerous back and forths and numerous recorded videos by George to give his thoughts on the issue. And uh, one of those you're going to see today. Now, what I have in front of you is an edited version of it. I knocked down the 40-minute video to 15 minutes. And what you've lost in that edit is some amazing information on the uh, background uh, of how we got to where we are for the options for emergency airway management, uh, George's technique of awake intubation by a topicalization, um, the idea of sedation facilitated intubation in general, amazing stuff. In fact, if you have 40 minutes, stop listening or watching what you're watching right now and just go to the full version in the same blog post in which you found this edited version. But if you don't have that much time, but you do want the background for the episode that's going to come out on Wednesday uh, on MCRIT, the MCRIT episode 247 is going to be dissociated awake intubation. If you want to understand all of the references I may make in that podcast, then you should watch this 15-minute video, and it will be well worth your time because uh, this video, even in its condensed form, is excellent. But again, if you have 40 minutes, watch the full video. If you only have 15 minutes, then watch this edited version here. Ketamine for Airway Management Toolboxes, Chainsaws, and MacGyver. So I was at the gym the other day and trying to decide what CME I was going to listen to. And I came across uh, Ruben Strayer's site, Emergency Medicine Updates, a great site. This month's uh, post was ketamine-only breathing intubation. It begins with a nine-minute video. Uh, Ruben uh, with a, a resident uh, demonstrating this procedure. And uh, uh, thanks, uh, Ruben, for, for sharing this video. And more importantly, sharing your views on this topic. Now, on the bottom of this page, there's an algorithm. And it describes uh, where they feel the use of uh, ketamine um, should be in terms of airway management strategies. Now, there's a little asterisk at the bottom of their page, and it says, Some airway experts disagree. And when you click on that, it takes uh, you to a post I did, Awake Intubation in the Emergency Department. Now, I'm definitely not a ketamine hater. I use uh, ketamine probably more than, than most people in, in my uh, department. I'm probably referring to statements I've made that um, I don't believe that we should call the use of ketamine when it's when it's uh, employed primarily as an awake approach. Um, I do like the term dissociated awake intubation, but that term's been used uh, variably by um, different people, and I'll get back to that later on. So this is the paper by uh, Andrew, uh, Michael, and Ruben, and congratulations for, uh, for doing this. As they state in this paper, there's very little uh, literature to support the use of ketamine as part of, of airway management, but they uh, describe things in, in detail and present where they feel this approach uh, should fit in terms of airway management strategies. Now, what do they mean by ketamine-only breathing intubation? It's the use of dissociative dose ketamine to facilitate intubation in the spontaneously breathing patient with or without the addition of topical anesthesia. So that's the definition they use. Various definitions that are out there, terms that are out there describing the use of ketamine for facilitating airway management. The one that we've used and the one I'm going to use for the remainder of this talk is ketamine facilitated intubation. Now, if you, if you uh, don't um, hear anything else, as part of this post, this is at least one of the most important messages that I have uh, about this topic, is that there, there is a distinct difference between an awake approach that uses ketamine, and what I mean by an awake approach that uses ketamine, is that uh, the awake portion really refers to the fact that your, your primary intervention 
is aggressive meticulous topicalization for both laryngoscopy and intubation. And you may or may not use ketamine along the way. And that's different than a ketamine approach that uses topicalization, in which the primary intervention is the ketamine. And then you may or may not use topicalization along the way. And both of these are very different from deep sedation or sedation facilitated intubation. So at the end of the day, assuming that, that we do have the skill um, and that we do have the equipment and the gear, do we need another option? Or is the awake and the RSI enough to manage the patients that are in front of us? I'm not sure. And uh, I, I really do think that, that we do perhaps need something a little bit more. So let's go back to our algorithm uh, again, I'm not saying that this is an algorithm that people should use, but this is the one that we use. And you assess the patient's anatomy and, and pathophysiology, and you assess them as being a difficult tracheal intubation, and the patient's uncooperative. Next thing you're supposed to do in this st state where you've got a difficult airway and they're uncooperative, you say, okay, if I can't tube them, am I going to be able to oxygenate them with bag mass ventilation and hopefully... Um, if that fails with uh, rescue oxygenation using a superglottic airway. But if I feel that that is unlikely, then it's really not advisable to go down the RSI route. And if this patient is truly uncooperative, an awake option is really not there. So this is where in our algorithm we list other options. Whenever your algorithm says C text, it's never good. And this is perhaps the role of ketamine facilitated intubation. So let's look again broadly at sedation in airway management. There's sedation facilitated airway management, otherwise historically deep sedation. There's ketamine facilitated intubation. And, and these two, I think, are different. And then there's the awake intubation. This is in brackets because you're, you may or may not use some form of sedation, usually anxiolysis, sometimes analgesia. And on occasion, you do need to dissociate your patient. So sedation facilitated intubation. This is what you know we've been saying for years. Um, some people agree, some people strongly disagree. Um, that it has none of the safety benefits of an awake intubation, none of the facilitated conditions of an RSI, and all the undesirable reflexes such as gag and potential laryngeal spasm, cough, and whatever are still in in place. And so we refer to it as, as no man's land. And there's been a, a quite a bit of literature on this multiple operating room studies with experienced physicians using big-time doses of induction agents, profile, big-time doses of accompanying narcotic without the use of neuromuscular blocking agents. And almost always they show poor intubating conditions, poor success rate when compared to the use of paralytics and higher complication rates. Now, again, there are, there are many, many people who believe that they have had a, a different um, outcome when they've employed sedation facilitated intubation. Uh, this is a review article from the clinics of uh, critical care, um, and they, they, they describe it as graded sequence intubation, again, using ketamine or using other, uh, other sedatives. I'm not a big fan of having uh, new terms, but uh, it, it, it's, this is a worthwhile read for sure. But I, I, my feeling is, and, and many of us feel that deep sedation or sedation facilitated intubation is really potentially playing with, with fire. I do think that there is a role for ketamine facilitated intubation, but I'm going to break it down really into, into two categories under ketamine facilitated intubation. There's the, a dissociated awake approach. And what I mean by that, that your primary approach is that you're going to attempt to do an awake and you're going to topicalize for laryngoscopy, which requires application of the 5% ointment, you know, the way we suggest anyway to, to do it, to the posterior th tongue and allow that to sort of melt down and do the vallecula so that they can tolerate the laryngoscope. And then applying uh, atomized lidocaine uh, to the glottic inlet and to the trachea to allow them to tolerate the endotracheal tube. And in this, in this patient population, and it could be upfront, 
um, that, that there's no question that, that uh, you know, that this patient is truly uncooperative. You might have to dissociate that patient or, you know, and, but you might have to do it so that you can, you can do proper topicalization. I'm not doing it as an alternative to uh, topicalize, to use uh, ketamine, right? I'm using it to facilitate it. And, or again, I could say I might be able to topicalize that patient, but you know what? They're one of these people that their, their gags just aren't going to allow me to do it. And this will happen. I might dissociate the patient at that point, or I might dissociate the patient later on um, just to tolerate the endotracheal tube, right? But the primary approach is to do a facilitated, you know, awake um, using topicalization as the primary approach and I may dissociate that patient. If I dissociate that patient as part of it, it's a dissociated awake intubation. The other group is the true ketamine only intubation. And this is the scenario, particularly in pre-hospital, where you just don't have scope of practice um, to do an RSI or to do an awake approach. And, uh, you know, there are two camps. There, there's a camp out there that, that's feeling that uh, pre-hospital, you know, depend, depending on provider, provider skill, and what the, the, the success route is of, of, the, uh, of the organization, um, that um, intubation shouldn't be part of scope of practice, and it should be bagging the patient and placing uh, um, superglottic airways. And then others who feel very strongly um, that, um, that, uh, that intubation should be part of that scope of practice, but, but how, do you, how do you deal with um, the issue in terms of what other options that they have? and that their traditional fentanyl midazolam route perhaps isn't the best. Does ketamine offer an advantage? And I don't know. Maybe it does. Um, there are several jurisdictions that, are, that I know that are in the process of switching over to ketamine alone for the free hospital systems. And I really look forward to hearing um, what, they're gonna, uh, what their results are and they're going to they're gonna, uh, publish their, their results. Uh, so, you know, the advantages of ketamine theoretically is that it provides excellent uh, pain control. Um, your patient's going to be unaware and they're going to maintain, you know, a, an awake a looking level of consciousness. But be clear, I, I, I don't think that um, we should call this, this patient awake, the dissociated patient awake. Um, they are dissociated. Um, they don't have uh, um, respiratory depression. Apnea is uncommon unless you administer large doses quickly. What evidence is out there is, is poor in terms of success rates. Really no better than what's been published using other sedation-only facilitated intubation approaches. But again, um, I think that there are people that are having higher success rates, and I look forward to, to reading those uh, publications. Um, let me skip to the potential for laryngospasm. It is, it is rare, but if it were to happen in a patient that you're worried about their airway, it obviously would be a disaster. The more common scenario that I think is a real one, and I do believe you're seeing that in Ruben's video, I don't think it's uncommon that, that uh, tone is increased in general in, in patients that receive ketamine. Now, that doesn't matter when you're busting pus you know, uh, draining an abscess. But if I'm doing laryngoscopy, having appropriate mouth opening to do good laryngoscopy, particularly if you're using a, a Macintosh um, um, device, um, you really do um, need cooperation um, or relaxation um, to do a, uh, a good laryngoscopy. That's my feeling. So when to do a KFI um, I, I like what they, what they, the way they presented it in their algorithm, the way uh, Ruben and, and Michael and Andrew presented it. Uh, similarly, in, in our approach, I think it's for patients uh, potentially with difficult tracheal intubation who are truly uncooperative, and you also don't think that um, you'd be able to bag mass ventilate them or place a superglottic airway, and it is the, uh, the best of the alternative options. I'm going to finish off with this is how, and this is what's different again and this is what the way i would favor using the term awake and dissociation in the same title a dissociated awake approach is that what you're doing here is you're 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 routinely looking at the patient you might judge them as being uncooperative but you, your approach is going to be similar to doing an awake right you're going to try to to topicalize their posterior third of the tongue using the use, using your ointment, and you're going to try atomizing the glottic inlet and the and the trachea so you can 
you, they will tolerate laryngoscopy and intubation. But I might use ketamine along the way, right? If, if they can't tolerate the topicalization process. So just like um, a DSI, right? You're doing it to pre-oxygenate your patient. You're doing it so that their, the procedure is to, is to uh, facilitate topicalization. Right. Or again, that they're the patient that you've topicalized, but they're just gag is just it's one of those one. They're one of these people that they they, they gag when they brush their molars. And, and you know what? Sometimes that will happen and it will fail. You might dissociate that patient. Right. Or you might dissociate them just during um, placement of the endotracheal tube. But your primary approach still is an awake one. And the reason why that is important is to really. You know, if you're doing an RSI, I don't care what's on your name tag, whether you're an RT, um, you know, uh, an eMERGE doc, uh, a paramedic, uh, flight nurse, you know, it, it's, as long as you're, you're experienced, you've got the skill set to take care of that patient. The same way it goes when you're doing an awake approach. And if I keep it simple, is that my approach is RSI, you know, or awake, and that awake might have to turn into a dissociated awake approach then we're gonna we're gonna be able to have that skill set to employ on the patient that presents with the uh, difficult um, um, pathology and um, difficult upper airway anatomically uh, um, challenging uh, cases um, as opposed to to sort of saying you know here's another pot that we might enter and it's ketamine facilitated where our primary approach is ketamine and then we just had atomize them um, near the end for them to tolerate the endotracheal tube. My fear is, is that because that's the easier of all three approaches, that that's what people who feel uncomfortable with doing an RSI don't feel that they have the skill set or equipment doing an awake. People are going to dump into that category, and we're going to go backwards in time. And and that's one of the concern that that, that I have. I'm just going to go back to our, our book um, that um, amairway.ca forward slash book airway management and emergencies the infinity edition. Um, what uh, what's nice about our book is that um, you know when papers like Rubens comes up, I can go in back in that night and, and change the content and upload his reference, and and then after I get permission, include his algorithm, and we have a link to the paper that's there. But even before I did it, this is what was in our in our section on ketamine. Currently, there's very little evidence, published evidence, supporting KFI in terms of safety and efficacy. It may be that KFI can fill the void of options that plague emergency RA management for patients in whom risk versus benefit assessment favors a non-RSI approach and an awake approach isn't feasible. However, at present, there is no literature to support this strategy. And hopefully, users of this approach will share their KFI experiences in the published literature in the near future. When I go into the woods, I go in with uh, my mentor, and uh, we go in with minimum three saws, if not four. And those saws have different purposes. I've got a small saw that if I'm up in a tree or up in a ladder, I can handle easily. I'm not using my great big heavy saw. If I'm taking down a big tree, I've got my big saw. And if I'm junking up in my backyard, my, uh, my firewood, I've got yet another saw. And the saw that I'm going to have soon is, uh, this is the Still 80. It's the big one, biggest one that they make. And uh, I'm going to use it for a completely different purpose, to make live edge slab wood. So again, if you're going to have real options, make sure you have a toolbox with the right gear in it. And you've got the right skill to use the gear that's in it. Take care.